Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another discussion on a Friday discussion for CSN. And we are so glad that you're joining us today. I'm with my friend, Dave Briggs. Dave, say hello. Hello. Great to All be right. with you. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about one more um, topic. And this one is on covetousness. And I know it's not a word that we use a lot uh, in our culture anymore, but it is one that definitely impacts and definitely um, is something that we have to address in our lives. So let's first just start out with defining it. What is covetousness? So covetousness is the desire for wealth or possessions for another's possessions, actually, uh, a craving to have that which belongs to another. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a pretty um, difficult thing when you consider that everything that we see that people have uh, is stuff that sometimes we want. So covetousness is very easy uh, to get into. It's very easy to want stuff that you see that other people possess. But where is it, where's that line, right? Where's that line where we can say, well, I'm not coveting, it's, I, I like it, I see it, but, but I don't desire it. Because I think once you begin to desire is where the problem is. So we wanna dig into that topic and really understand what, what does scripture say about it and what can we do to help us to live a life that is apart from covetousness, that we would be free from that. Um, one of the things that I just wanna start off with also is that it is part of the 10 commandments. It's the last commandment actually says that, you know, you're, it forbids coveting anything that belongs to your neighbor, uh, including your house, your wife, your servants, uh, oxes, donkeys, all of that, anything that belongs to him. So it is definitely addressed by scripture and something that we need to make sure that we understand and know how to navigate in our own lives. Um, another important scripture that if you've been through the stewardship impact um, workshop that we do through CSN, that you'll know is Mark 4. And Mark 4 talks about the four seeds. And that third seed really addresses not specifically covetousness, but those three things that we deal with address it very clearly. So Dave, why don't we just kind of dig into that scripture and then go from there? You know, I'm, I'm glad uh, you chose this particular topic of covetousness because obviously it's incredibly important in the Bible, but we don't use that term very much. I mean, when was the last time you heard somebody actually use, use the word in, in conversation? Not very often. But because of that, I think a lot of times we fail to dig deeply into what God really wants us to know you know, when he talks about covetousness. And mm -hmm. I immediately, as, as you mentioned, Mark 4, I immediately thought of how powerful Jesus' teaching is in Mark 4 when he talks about the parable of the four soils and the four seeds, mm -hmm. particularly as he's describing the third seed. And uh, just thought I'd take a minute to to specifically read what um, what Jesus says when he's explaining to his disciples um, the significance of the of the third seed. He says, still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things mm -hmm. come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Now, the desires for other things is really just a description of covetousness. Right. And of all the things that Jesus mentioned, one of them is this idea of covetousness, desiring other things that beyond what you already have. And, and the significance of that is when he says, when these things get a foothold in your life, the impact is it makes the word unfruitful. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus is tying together for his disciples and, and for all of us, is that when covetousness is present in our lives, it impacts the fruitfulness of God's word in our lives. And that's why we need to take this, you know, very, very seriously. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when you, when your desire for possessions uh, becomes so strong, it, it's all consuming. I mean, it becomes the focus. And that's so easy to do. It's so easy to start focusing on something. And before you know it, it just has your attention. Uh, one of the the examples I can use, I think that all of us have, have run across is when you're looking for a vehicle, like a new model of some kind of vehicle that you like comes out. And once you notice that model, like you see it everywhere. <laughs> it just begins to be like pops up here and there. And then every time you're searching for it, and especially today with the marketing that's done, where if you're searching for an item, now every website you go to, that item pops up on the right screen, right? So it's so easy to be 
for it to become this all consuming where it's just takes up so much of our effort and so much of our focus that it's easy for us to become persuaded to desire this thing before we realize, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm spending way too much time, potentially more resources than I should on something that I don't really need. It's not a basic need in life. Well, I'm not really obsessing over the next meal. I'm obsessing over, you know, whether I should redo my floors or buy a new car or buy a bigger car or buy a bigger house, whatever. And I think when you begin to understand the destruction that that can have in your life and the, the loss of purpose and focus, because it pulls you aside to something that you never really were meant to focus on. Uh, God said, Matthew 6 really affirms the fact that God says, don't worry about these things. You're, you're, you're going to get them. Just seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things will be given to you. And I think that's where we need to understand that there are differences between needs and wants. And covetousness is always a want. It's not, it's never a, you know, I'm coveting a meal. I've never coveted a meal. I've always had enough. It's the other things that can so easily uh, persuade and draw us aside. You know, and, and the culture is not helping here at all. Because if this, is, this is one of these cases where the is trying to drag us in the opposite direction of where God wants us to go. And we see this, like you mentioned, through commercial. Commercials in general. Because basically the majority of commercials, if you think about this, the majority of commercials are trying to get us to covet more. Mm -hmm. Whatever they're trying to post, whatever they're trying to present, they are trying to get us into a coveting mode to covet the thing that they're trying to promote. And they do it, they do it by creating uh, dissatisfaction in our lives with what we currently have. Mm -hmm. Because if we can become dissatisfied with what we currently have, you know, to your point about the car, if we can become dissatisfied with the car we're driving, then they've got us in a perfect position to be able to promote us coveting a brand new car. Yeah. And so this is just a perfect example of where, where, where the culture is trying to take us in exactly the opposite direction as God, of God's word. Because when we covet, we have essentially fallen into the trap of not being content. Mm -hmm. And the Bible continually tells us, be content with what you have. Mm -hmm. And when we're content, then it, it takes the teeth out of the desire to covet because in our contentment, we're not desiring more things. Yeah. And so that's really why this is an incredibly important topic for us to pursue probably in more detail than we normally do. Yeah. So there's a balance. I think it's, it's not easy today. I think probably more than any other time in, his, other time in history, we are dealing with so much um, information coming at us, so many things being created every day that could potentially be good for us, could actually make our life better, more productive, all of those things. But yet it becomes this going after one thing after another, after another, after another, and it begins to literally take over our heart where we're pursuing things that, honestly, we, we could live without them, but it becomes, it almost feels like I got to have this. I was I was uh, texting with my brother yesterday, and uh, I had I had just sold the old vehicle that I had for like six years, and so we were just kind of talking back and forth because he has a similar vehicle, and he said to me, he said I really need, uh, and he said the kind of model car that he wants. He's been looking for like a year and a half for this vehicle, and I just I put a smiley face and then in bold caps need question mark you know, and of course he responded back. It's like yeah I know I don't need it but I really want it I'm like. Let's call it what it is, right? Because if we don't, if our language is, I need this, then it sets us up to really desire it to the degree that it becomes unhealthy. So it's not just that the thing itself is wrong. It may not be. It may be totally fine to have it and to enjoy it. It's when it becomes the focus. Because in some degree, that's idolatry, right? I've taken my eyes off of what I'm called and purposed to do, which is to worship God. And now I begin to worship other things, even if it's just for a moment, maybe it's just for an hour or two, but to take my eyes and my worship off of God and put it on a thing where it becomes a focus of my life, not just something I enjoy on my downtime or something that I do occasionally and then back to my purpose, but something that becomes, you know, and we can see that so prevalent in our culture, whether it's uh, sports, whether it's 
just so many things can can take our attention. So um, it, it's, I believe that's why God is so against it, is that it literally does take our focus off of him. Well, and one of the things that I, I think it's easy to, to, to pass over is coveting taken to its extreme will lead to sin. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, if, if, if I, you know, using the, the biblical example of if, if I desire your oxen so deeply that I would consider stealing it, then covetousness had, has led to sin and it can also lead to incredible danger. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole idea of coveting your neighbor's wife. I mean, if you want to get into huge trouble, you just let that yeah. go to its ultimate end. And it very well could not only lead to sin, but could lead to um, the kind of conflict that could cause you, you know, to be killed. Yeah. The, the idea of not coveting is, is not just a minor thing. And I think that's why it continues to pop up in numerous scriptures. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a number of scriptures that we kind of pass over in this whole issue. Um, uh, in Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, um, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Mm -hmm. And then all of the times in which covetousness is listed along with other very, very dangerous sins, not because God doesn't want us to have stuff, but because it can lead to um, not only an unhealthy life, but, but some very serious sin. I agree. I mean, you look at the life of David, even though David's well known as a, a man after God's own heart, but yet his covetousness and he had more than one wife so him coveting one other woman uh, is just such a clear example of what covetousness is right that i'm desiring something that i already have but that it's so dangerous not only did it in fact uh, affect his own leadership but it affected his family i mean there was all kinds of mess that happened for years to come after uh, after this event that happened in his own family and so it, it has a ripple effect in our lives that's why it's so important for us to keep it at bay to not uh to really address it as it is and i think that's why that's why we chose this topic to talk about covetousness not you know dummy it down and make it a little more pleasant because it is a very dangerous thing um so let me ask this question dave and maybe we can tackle it together but, but as it relates to money and how do we keep becoming covetous because there's so much to be desired in this world uh, today how do we how do we stay safe how do we understand when we're about to cross that line, what, what can we do? How can we be more um, aware when covetousness is at the door? Yeah, and boy, that, that, that is exactly the right question. And I, I would go back to uh, uh, Mark 4 again, mm. because the, the difficulty of the third seed leads to the promise and the positive aspect of the fourth seed. And mm. so again, going, going back to that, Jesus is describing the fourth seed. He says, others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop some 30, some 60, some 100 times. I think uh, Jesus is giving us the answer here that when we hear the word and we accept it, or we own it, or we internalize it, it becomes part of how we're going to order our lives on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I think what Jesus is saying here is you then become uh, inoculated or immunized against some of these things that were presented in the third seed. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, as, as simple as it sounds, the more time we spend immersed in God's word, and the more time that we apply God's word to the decisions we make on a daily basis, the more I think we are going to be guarded against falling into uh, constantly coveting other things. Yeah. The opposite is also true. The less we are in the word, the more we likely we are to be persuaded and to be drawn uh, to things that we desire and things that are in abundance, not bad things, but things that end up overall taking over our lives and then becoming the focus of our lives. And with every one of these, uh, these discussions that we've had so far, 
it always comes back to God's word. And I think about how important this is for us to make that distinction that it's not, we don't have the answer. In fact, if anything, we are, we can be so easily persuaded and move from one opinion to another, especially today with so many opinions out there. I mean, if you get on Facebook and just start watching the video feed, um, you'll just hear all kinds of debates and all kinds of things going on. And you can literally change your mind from one moment to another, depending on the speaker. Well, that seems right. That seems right. And then next thing you know, it's like, I don't even know what's right. I think I believe that, but I'm not sure why I believe it. And I think that's why you see so much um, discontent and so much uh, uh, disagreement and division, because yeah. there's not a standard. We've all began to create a standard based on what we believe. And we as Christians don't have that luxury. We know better. We have a standard. It's the word of God. The word of God gives us the clarity. And one of, my, one of the things that my pastor recently said, he said, he did a quick video, a Facebook thing that he said, you know, every time I read the newspaper or the morning news, not the actual newspaper, because we don't do that anymore. But he said, I have that in front of me and I have my Bible next to it. So I'll listen to something and I'll go back to the word and say, how does that, does that drive? Does that, is that true? Is that, what's wrong with it? So it's filtering everything we hear, everything that we do based on God's word. Because God's word gives us the plan and gives us the, the wisdom uh, and the principles that we need to live on that will not let us down. It would not allow us to get into situations where we are being literally drawn away from our affection to God, to our family, to, to the things that will keep us um, you know, holy and pure rather than you know, getting to the stuff that covetousness will lead to, which is sin and eventually, as you said, death. Well, you know, in uh, Hebrews 13, 5, I love that because it says, let your conduct be without covetousness, but be content mm -hmm. in such things that you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Mm -hmm. This idea of contentment again, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and, and I am convinced that comparison destroys contentment. You know, we talk about that a lot in our classes, but but when we find ourselves comparing what we have with what other people have that have things better than we do yeah then then we are getting ready to fall into a trap yeah. of coveting what other people have that that is is a step up from what we have i mean if we have the xyz7 and somebody else has got the xyz9 mm -hmm. all of a sudden now we got to have the xyz9 yeah and if when you when you originally asked the question, what can we do to know when we are getting too close to that line? I think we just need to ask ourselves, how much time are we spending comparing what we have mm. to what other people have? Because comparison destroys contentment. And when our contentment is destroyed, we are easy prey yeah. for coveting what other people have. That's so true. And, and the Bible is very clear. Like we're not to slowly and easily dabble with this and try to you know it's not soft on this in fact colossians 3 5 says therefore put to death <laughs> let me put to death your members which are on the earth fornication uncleanness passion evil desires and covetousness which is idolatry so god is not mincing any words here he's saying look this is fire that will burn you like you cannot take this easy um and and i think you hit it right on the head dave Comparison is our biggest um, challenge, I think, because we see others that are more successful than we are. And today, because so many people can have their five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes of fame, it's so easy to say, gosh, look at the accolades, look at the wealth, look at the success this person's having. You know, I should have that, right? It's just a natural desire that we have. We need to recognize it and then go back to God's word and as you said, if we recognize that we have everything, I mean, that scripture says, I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. And I think if we keep that in mind and in focus, it helps us to recognize that God's word, God's presence, God's provision is what we need. It's not the things that we are pursuing. It's not trying to be better than someone else that will bring that fulfillment and contentment that, that we desire. So yeah, so I, I, heard, know that. I heard a quote that I love. It's, it's a simple, it says, Happy is the person who wants what he already has. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. That's true. 
I think, I think that's a great place to end. You know, we, we can look around and realize how blessed we really are. If we just take an inventory of where we are and how much God has already blessed us, it's so easy um, to lose sight of that and want the next thing. But if you just stop and say, gosh, I already have more than enough. I mean, it's incredible how much wealth and how much comfort and blessings we've, we've received and that we have available at our fingertips today. And that's for most of us that live here in the United States. And, and I'm grateful for that. And at the same time, it's so easy for me to want more. And I think it's a great place to, to consider that if we don't go back to God's word, if we don't recognize that this is easy for all of us to jump into and to get lost in, um, but if we keep our eyes on him, we keep our eyes on the fact that we are already beyond blessed, then that contentment can happen in our hearts. So when the next thing comes up or the next comparison happens, we can shut it down and say, you know what? I'm fine. I'm okay. You know? He's with me. I have all that I need. And if he wants to give me more, I look at it this way. The more God gives us, the more responsibility we have. Who's up for more responsibility? <laughs> I think we got to be cautious about asking for more of that. So, well, Dave, I appreciate your time. I appreciate this discussion. I think it's, uh, it's certainly challenged me. Just some of the things that you said makes me just reinforce the fact that I need to go back to God's word more often in order to overcome these things in my own life. So I appreciate that, uh, that prodding. Well, well, and I also want to go ahead. Great having, great having this discussion. And uh, like you say, if, if we can keep our eyes on Jesus, we can keep our eyes on his word, mm -hmm. then it, it forms a, a, a bit of a protection from us wandering off into this desire to constantly have more and more. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this video. Uh, we'll see you next time. And I hope you have a great and wonderful day.